How's it going everyone? In this video, we'll be fleshing out the player controller we set up in the previous episode by adding smooth crouching, coyote time, and visual feedback for jumping and landing, as well as the first layer of procedural animations for our view model. If you found this video without watching the startup episode, welcome to the channel. I'd highly recommend going back and working through the first video in this series to get caught up to speed, but if you're already working on your own project, there's still several techniques shown in this video that may prove useful to know. It's also worth mentioning that portions of this video where a lot of nodes are placed are shown as a time lapse. I'll still be explaining out loud what's happening at a high level, but feel free to adjust the playback speed or pause the video to make sure we're still on the same page. With that out of the way, let's get started. To start off, we'll navigate to your project settings and add an input called Crouch, bound to left control. Then, we'll open your first person character blueprint and add a call to this input. The released output of this will lead to a set timer by function name node. Set function name to check can stand, set the time to 1 over 60 for 60 checks per second, and set looping to true. Promote the return value of this node to a new variable called uncrouch timer. After the pressed output, add a clear and invalidate timer by handle node with the handle input using the return value of our set uncrouch timer. Add a new custom event called stand up, then add a new timeline component called crouch tl with play coming from the pressed exec line and reverse using stand up. Open crouch tl and add a new float curve called crouch alpha. Set the timeline's length to 0.2 and use last keyframe to true. Right click to add keyframes to the curve and make sure to change their type from linear to user and use the values for each shown on screen now. Back in the event graph, promote the timeline's output to a new float variable called crouch alpha and create another new float variable called base walk speed with the default value of 600. We'll then add a lerp node and use crouch alpha to lerp between base walk speed and half of base walk speed. Grab a reference to the character movement component and set its max walk speed value to the output of the lerp node. We'll then create a new float variable called stand height, setting its default value to whatever our capsule component's half height is. In this case, it's 96. Add another float variable called crouch height, setting its default value to 55. Adjust this value as you'd like to get a taller or shorter fully crouched height. Add another lerp node and again use crouch alpha to lerp between stand height and crouch height. Dragging in a reference to the capsule component, call set capsule half height with update overlaps ticked on, and use the output of the lerp node to drive the half height input. Now we'll create a new function called check can stand, making sure the spelling is identical to what we inputted in our initial set timer by function name node. Every time check can stand is called, we'll perform a sphere trace in the upward direction, making sure we have enough room to stand when attempting to uncrouch. If the sphere trace doesn't collide with anything, or if our character is mid-air, we'll successfully call our stand-up custom event and proceed to uncrouch, as well as clearing our uncrouch timer. Feel free to pause this time lapse at any point to copy the nodes I have set up in this function. At this point, you should be able to smoothly crouch under obstacles. If the crouch key is released while still underneath a blocking surface, the function we set up will continuously check if we have space to stand automatically uncrouching the character once there is enough room to do so. Once this is working properly, we're ready to move on to setting up coyote time. Back in our player character's event graph, we'll call the event on movement mode changed and check whether the new movement mode is falling. If the player is falling, we'll add a set timer by event node, as well as a new custom event called coyote time passed, binding it to the timer node. Normalize the vector length of our pawn's velocity to a range of zero to our base walk speed variable and clamp the result. Use the result to lerp between 0.25 and 1, and multiply the output by a new float variable called coyote time, setting its default value to 0.35. Plug the product into the time input of our timer node, and promote the timer to a variable called coyote timer. Add a call to on landed and on jumped, using both to clear coyote timer once we've officially landed or successfully jumped. For those who don't know, coyote time is a technique in games meant to give the player a grace period in which they can jump while in midair preventing frustrating situations where their character just walks off an edge because the jump button was pressed a split second after leaving the surface. For first-person games, this is especially helpful as you usually won't be looking down at the ledge you're jumping off of, but instead outward at the location you're trying to jump to. To complete this feature, we'll start by overriding the built-in canJump function. Right-click on the input node to call the parent function, and get the remaining time of our coyote timer variable to check if it's greater than zero. Use an OR node comparing the outputs of the parent function call and the greater than node. Then use an AND node to make sure our uncrouched timer is inactive, and therefore that we're not under a surface that would block a jump if we're crouching. Pass the result into the return value of the return node, and we finished up our coyote time. To add some feedback to jumping and landing, 
We'll start by adding a new custom event called dip, with two float inputs called speed and strength, both defaulting to one. Then, add a new timeline called dip tl. Get a reference to this timeline, then use the set play rate node to change the playback speed using the speed input from our dip event. Promote the strength input to a new float variable called dip strength, setting it after the set play rate node. Now we can call this dip event from anywhere on our character, changing the speed and strength of the dip on a case by case basis. Open up the dip tl timeline, setting its length to 1 second and enabling use last keyframe. Add a new float curve called dip alpha, and right click to add keyframes to the curve. After changing the key type to user, use the handles to adjust the tangents, matching the shape and values shown on screen now. Back in the event graph, multiply the variable dip strength by the new float output dip alpha on the timeline. Promote the product to a new float variable called dip alpha and use the update execution line to set this value continuously whenever the timeline is running. Use dip alpha to alert between the starting relative z value of fp root and the maximum distance to offset it downwards by, in this case 0 and negative 10. Use a make vector node to create this offset vector combining the result of the lerp node in z with the current relative x and y of fp root. Then, get a reference to fp root and use a set relative location node to update the location of the component with the timeline. We can now put this effect to use by calling our dip event after on jumps, setting speed to 5 and strength to 1. Add a new custom event called landing dip, calling it after the on landed event. Using our character movement component, We'll get the vector length of our z velocity one frame before we landed by calling get last update velocity. Grab the jump z velocity variable from character movement and normalize the vector length node result to a range of 0 to jump z velocity. Clamp the normalized value from 0 to 1 and finally call the dip event, setting speed to 3 and drive the strength input with the return value of the clamp node. Now we're ready to move on to the meat and potatoes of this video, procedural walking animations. Add a new timeline called walking TL and open it, enabling use last keyframe, autoplay, and loop. Then add three float curves called left right alpha, up down alpha, and roll alpha, and one event curve called footstep. Again, use the handles and the values shown on screen to recreate these curves in your own project. Back in the event graph, create a new vector variable called walk anim pause and a new rotator variable called walk anim rot. Call a set of each variable, splitting the struct pin on both nodes' inputs. Then, add a lerp between negative 0.4 and 0.4, driven by left right alpha for the vector's x value, and a lerp between negative 0.35 and 0.2, driven by up down alpha for the vector's z value. Add another lerp between 1 and negative 1, driven by roll alpha and use the result for the rotator's y value. Use the length of the player's velocity normalized from 0 to base walk speed to drive the b input of a select float node. Pick a will come from the player's movement mode equaling falling, and will promote the result to a new float variable called walk anim alpha. Use this float to alert between 0 and 1.65, and call the timeline to update its play rate continuously with the result of the lerp. Then we'll add a new function called getVelocityVars, which will provide us with a smoothly updated vector value to use for our procedural animation. Feel free to pause the video here to copy the nodes as I have them arranged, and make sure to use get world delta seconds as I have here, so the result is consistent regardless of frame rate. After this function is completed, add it to the very end of walking TL's update execution line to call it continuously. Moving over to our first person AnimBP, open the event graph and clear out all pre-existing logic except for the update animation node. We'll delete the two default boolean variables here as well. Add a begin play node and use try get pawn owner to cast a first person character, promoting the return value to a new variable called player ref. Then use a validated get node after update animation to access all of the variables we'll need from the player pawn. Promote each one to a variable within the AnimBP, retaining their original names and update all of the variables using set nodes driven by the execution line from update animation. Over in the anim graph, we'll add a local to component node after slot arms, followed by our first of several transform bone nodes. Set its translation x to negative 2 and z to negative 2, its rotation y to negative 5, and set the bone to modify to spine 3 
Change the translation and rotation modes to add to existing, and bind the alpha to crouch alpha. Enable interp result on the alpha, and we've completed our first procedural animation. Add another transform bone node with its bone to modify set to spine 3. Bind translation to walk in and pause, and rotation to walk in and rot. Set the translation and rotation modes to add to existing, and bind alpha to walk in and alpha. Enable interp result and set both interp speed options to 5. Add another transform bone node with its bone to modify set to spine 3. Hide the pins for rotation and scale, and bind the translation to location lag pause and set its mode to add to existing. Add yet another transform bone node with its bone to modify set to spine 3. Split the input pins for translation and rotation, and hide the scale pin. Using location lag pause again, half of its x value goes into translation z, and double its x value goes into rotation y. Set translation and rotation modes to add to existing. Add the final transform bone node with its bone to modify set to spine 3. Remove all input pins and set the translation Z to negative 10. Set translation mode to add to existing, bind alpha to dip alpha, and enable interp result. Finally, add a component to local node after all of these transform bone nodes, and plug the result into final pose. Playing in the editor, you can see that we now have fully procedural locomotion animations using just one base pose and several transform bone nodes. This allows for nearly seamless layering of detail with very minimal work required outside of Unreal. You'll be able to easily apply this animation setup to any kind of weapon you want your character to hold while keeping their walking cadence perfectly consistent. We've also made ourselves a solid smooth crouching mechanic, as well as adding coyote time, an often overlooked but crucial quality of life feature. In the next episode, we'll focus primarily on using a similar technique to add procedural weapon sway, as well as implementing some sound effects in our walking, jumping, and landing animations. I hope this video helped you out in some way, and stay tuned for more coming soon. Until next time.